Hey, what's going on? Welcome to Vienna Ensemble Pro Part 2. If you haven't already watched the first one, you might want to go back and check it out. Just the number before this, which I think is number four. So, Vienna Ensemble. We're doing strings and synth today. Yesterday we did winds and drums. Maybe a quick preface. The way I break up all my samples between the computers, each one of these slaves, which are from visiondaw.com, and actually the next episode is going to be about Cubase and how it hooks up to VE Pro, and I'm going to go into a lot more detail about the computer specs and the hardware that's used to connect them and that sort of a thing. I figured this is just a cursory look at the samples themselves. But each computer has four or more rated SSD drives, which is where the samples sit. So I'm not really needing to break up the drives, like think, okay, I want to put my uh, short strings on this drive, and I want to put my long strings on this drive, because if they're both playing at the same time, I want to be able to optimize the data streaming off the drives. It's actually pulling from all four of them. I think the slaves are four each at the same time, which means you're kind of getting a four time speed increase. But it is RAID zero, I'm pretty sure. And correct me in the comments if I'm wrong. It's just the one that just bundles them as one big drive and it doesn't have any redundancy or backup options or anything like that. So with that being said, let's take a look over here at strings. And I'm going to do my favorite switch in the world, which is getting rid of me, because you don't need to look at me staring at the computer. So strings 01. Uh, first thing I've got in here is Spitfire. And what can I say? I, I really, really like Spitfire stuff. Um, again, probably two-thirds of their articulations I have loaded. I have two banks of violins, one. And here's the second bank. So I'm sure there are some things that I don't have in here, but most of them are probably covered. And then violins two, and I got to admit it, I do really like it when a library has a violin one and a violin two. I'm not a big fan of doubling up violin one and doing panning and things like that. It's nice to know if you do a unison, it's an actual big fat unison. And again, probably the same patches as violin one because Spitfire does a wonderful job at keeping things consistent. And split into long and short again, which you can see down here at the bottom are our contact outs. Two banks of violas. I imagine they're going to be the same patches as we have from the violins. Now, I know there's um, a way that you can do key switches, there's about 10 different ways actually you can switch patches within the Spitfire editor and I researched all that stuff as well as the, it just escaped me, um, performance, uh, there's a Cubase feature that allows you to map articulations and have them be more like control changes and I'm completely forgetting what it is at the moment but I'll add it in the comments. It's amazing and I tried it out and it worked really well, um, I just had too many. And to, to, to fit all the articulations in, in the window, it was just, it was way too crammed. And honestly, I really do like it better when I have individual MIDI, individual MIDI channels for each one of these things. And it makes it a lot more simple too if I need to send it to Paul Taylor, my uh, music prep guy, instead of having to explain to him what sounds were what, he can literally just look at the name of the track and say, oh, okay, you're using the Colenio here, but over here you're using um, the Consordino Tremolo or whatnot. It makes it a lot easier to put it on the page correctly than if you have to explain patch changes or anything like that. My, my old library, actually, I used to use patch changes because I liked the idea of things being super consistent and concise. So if you looked at my template, it was it was literally like I had five patches at the bottom because I was using all of my custom strings. So it was just violin one, violin two, viola, cello, ba <laughs> bass. And I would use patch changes within each of that one track. And it made it great because it was just one MIDI track. But the problem was 
when I first started doing things, um, exporting for live, I would literally have to spend an hour and make all the notes and figure out what the patch was, and it became a bit of a hassle. So that's why we're sticking with this kind of from here on out, I think. Violins 2, uh, Cherry 2. Looks like it's pretty much the same patches, just within each section. So a lot of times, like if we go up to violin one, and you see, where are those shorts? Here we go. Short one second, short five, half a second, and short spiccato. Basically, it's short, medium, and long within the short articulation. So what I do in Cubase is I actually have that as a um, separate MIDI track because a lot of times I like to stack them a little bit. I used to have them on one MIDI track and I would use the mod wheel to change the length. And it just ended up, I sometimes I want to have both or not just one. And it was a lot easier for me, again, having them on separate tracks. So all this is basically a work in progress even though I've been working on it for years now. Um, the Albion stuff has some really nice sounds in it that are really good for ensembles. I don't use ensemble sounds that much, probably not at all on their own, but it is nice maybe to have them layered with something else and kind of emphasizing the ensemble sound. And I'll have all my individual MIDI tracks detailed and then an ensemble one that I won't even export if I'm going to live because it's basically redundant. Oh, high string runs, and then Albion 2. So let's see, as, as you can see over here on the left, I've got the first four Albions. So I've taken everything and kind of put it in according to Albion number. And if you look at my things over here, this is um, all strings, and I've updated the Chris Hines solo string, so I need to put the new ones in there. But this is all strings and synth. There isn't anything with drums or brass or woodwinds because this is basically the string and synth computer. So a lot of it for me is about economy of space when you have this many libraries that you want to have open at the same time. I don't really see a need to have a redundant copy of all the Albion brass on all three machines. So the brass only exists on the computer that plays brass and the contact libraries will only show brass over there. They're not going to show strings. So it's kind of like just, you know, dividing everything really neatly on your plate and keeping it all separate from each other. Albion 2, high strings, Albion 2, low strings, ensemble stuff. A lot of times I do include the ensembles, even though they might be a little redundant. Honestly, I have yet, I think I used a pizzicato ensemble one time. <laughs> Just because I wanted to add a little more life to the sound. So I had the individual strings playing pits, and then I added the ensemble pits, I think maybe in the basses as well, just to accentuate the low end. Uh, normally I don't really do that. Now we're in Albion 3 with the woodwinds and brass and low strings, some really nice big beefy low strings in Albion 3. And the um, Masse, Mass, Moss, I don't, however you pronounce that, they're great as well. A little more synthy and intentionally so. I've never used them, not because they don't sound great. I just can't quite find the right place to do it. A lot of times, if I need something that is more contextual, but still sounds like an orchestra, I end up going to other synth things that have orchestra basses instead of using that, but I still have it loaded because I just kind of really like to have that option. Options are always great, especially if you're like, oh, I remember that really great cold violin sound or whatever it was they had that I really appreciated. They had a super long attack and release on it. And if I want to pull it up, all I have to do is just load it and I'm good to go. Now I gotta be honest, um, this is probably my favorite string library, Cinematic Studio Strings. There's just something to be said about the simplicity, not, not only of the interface. The interface is obviously simple, eight patches, you can change things around, 
you can turn the legato on and off. You've got an advanced mode. I never look at the interface because I'm always just using my template in Cubase. But I love, first of all, the legato is probably the best sounding legato I've heard, hands down. I love the sound of the strings, how they're a little more intimate, and I can really hear the vibrato. I love that I have um, the vibrato actually set to CC2. Maybe that's the, the, the default. I'm not exactly sure. Velocity cross, uh, maybe that's the default, or maybe I changed it, but the vibrato sounds really nice, and just using a crossfader to go from non-vibrato to vibrato, and I can tweak the amount of vibrato in there is really, really nice, and as opposed to having to use, like with a lot of the Spitfire stuff, um, a non-vibrato patch versus a multi-vibrato patch. And legato-wise, I'm also super impatient when it comes to finding sounds. I don't want to have eight different kinds of legato. Um, I know there's some libraries out there that are not in my template that probably sound amazing. Um, uh, 8DO has some really good stuff that I've heard about. And um, East West, the Play Composer Cloud, I know they've got lots of legatos and lots of different articulations and things. And honestly, I get a little overwhelmed when it comes to things like that because I'd want to put, it's like I'd want to put them all into my palette. And then I'd be sitting there auditioning 10 different kinds of legato just on a single library when what I really need to be doing is composing. And the Cinematic Studio Strings legato just really sounds second to none. It's probably my, it is my go-to library. And the shorts are um, really, really nice. They have a mod wheel assignment. I'm going to assume this is the short staccato. So see, you've got four different lengths. Spiccato, staccatissimo, staccato, and sforzando, which is basically just a staccato with a sustain at the end of it. And I know I mentioned stacking shorts with Spitfire. I don't feel a need to stack the shorts on these, and having that sforzando at the top of the mod wheel really makes a difference in the playing when you're trying to get a line to sound expressive. It's just, it's just really, really nice. It's like, it's like he designed this library around the way I want it. And there's even measured tremolo in there. And for those of you who don't know, so the difference between tremolo, which has the three lines here, tremolo is just the string players moving their bow back and forth as quickly as they can. Measured tremolo, on the other hand, is moving it according to a tempo. And that's a lot of cool kind of uh, film music sort of engine kind of digga 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 digga. They're just doing two notes per two bow strokes per note, and it sounds a lot faster than it really is. But it's a great technique, great effect. So Spitfire and Cinematic Studio Strings, it's basically, <laughs> I can just show you this interface. I have all these loaded, that's what it comes down to. I have them all loaded for viola, I just have them on separate patches. Celli and Contrabass. Um, these are actually my strings, which ends up taking a little more room on the left than the other ones, just because I have so many articulations. Um, this all started when I was first working on um, Dead Space, geez, 11 years ago now. I started sampling my own strings, and it was more of a test. And again, Dead Space will be a whole other video, or two or three how I did it and how I came up with the idea of um, getting the score recorded and how I composed the tracks. But I kind of fell in love with sampling orchestra back then, and ever since those first couple of sessions for Dead Space, I've always booked an extra day of studio time wherever I'm recording with some group of musicians. Maybe it's just six French horns, maybe it's the viola section, maybe it's a bunch of flutes, and I'll, will have prepared, you know, even if it's a half day session, maybe I'll split with somebody else. I'll have prepared stuff and we'll basically sample them. So that's where a lot of this, well, it's where all of this comes from. Um, and these are all performance patches. They're not like one-offs. Um, it's not something that is a sampled phrase that you hold down once and it plays and you're done. These are very long 20 or 30 second 
Jeez, how many of these are there? There we go. There's only three on that last one. 20 or 30 second performances usually broken up at least four different ways. So I'll get the performance quiet and loud. And then a lot of times I'll have an alternate version. Like if they're playing a really high note, I'll get it quiet and loud. And then I'll get it with like molto vibrato, like half step bends almost. And I'll have two different controllers. So one will control the dynamic of the performance and the other one will control whether it's bendy or not. And between those two controllers, you really get this great idea that there's a string section performing an effect either to picture or to the music itself, as opposed to just a static kind of sound that you hold down the key and it, it plays for three seconds and it's got a, maybe it loops, but since it's so short and varied, the loop doesn't really work. The key for me was recording very, um, what's the word, like non-dynamic articulations. So when they were playing quiet, I got that quiet one for 20 or 25 seconds and it was consistent. So when I looped, you really couldn't hear it. Same thing with the loud ones, same thing with the bends. It makes it more of a performance instrument than it does just a one trick pony. And the violins, um, violin twos, they're gonna be the same articulations as violin ones. As a matter of fact, if we go to violas, you're probably gonna see a lot of the same thing because I did always like the idea of consistency between sections. So I'm, I'm, I'm not scrolling down just because it's kind of the same articulations across all the sections. Yep. What do we have next? Ah, solo strings. I really do like the Spitfire solo strings. I've got whichever ones they had before this new round in June of 2018 kind of came out. And the ar artisan performances are also really, really nice. And Chris Hine um, solo strings are also really good too. There's something to be said. Jeez, oh, I need to upgrade my beta from Emberton. Durr. There's something to be said for the way that they have modeled them. There's a lot of possibility. And a lot of times I'll use the solo strings, and it depends on the passage and the kind of context of the music, which solo strings I pick. But I'll use the solo strings and just double them with the rest of the string section. First violin, second violin, viola, I mean top to down, all, all five players. And just turn it up a little bit, kind of like as if it were a first chair desk mic. And getting a little more of that kind of definition and articulation in there. And I've also always been a fan. Again, this goes back to, this is just an updated version of what Peter Seidlicek has been doing at sample modeling forever. So I've got their strings as well. On to number two. And here we have my second favorite string library. Probably three years ago, when I really was able to expand my palette a little bit with these PCs and have more things loaded, I started acquiring a couple of more string libraries and I discovered rather quickly, originally my idea was, oh, well with each project, if I can't do live, I'll come up with an interesting, to my ears, sort of combination of string libraries that will, you know, make that particular project sound different from another project. And I've got longs and shorts, not legato, but longs and shorts and things in my own string library as well. So a lot of times I'll have my own library and maybe I would augment that with um, like the Spitfire normal symphonic strings library. And I found this combination of cinematic studio strings and chamber strings from Spitfire. And there's something about the way they stick together. It's kind of like, they kind of fit like this. Chamber strings are obviously chamber. They're very small. I was surprised when I read online, it's something like four violins, four violins, three violas, two cellos, and a bass. It's really small. But they've got this kind of small pointed sort of definition to them and you can hear the vibrato and you can really hear the legato. And then the cinematic studio strings are, are, are a lot wider and bigger. It's a larger ensemble, but it's still in kind of a drier environment. And I don't think they're quite as big, nor were they recorded in a hall as big as air studios, which is where the symphonic strings, all of Spitfire stuff is recorded. 
That's why I say they kind of fit together like this. They just seem to go really well together. And my idea of having different string libraries for different projects sort of fell by the wayside after about six months because I love that combination so much. And I've, I've used it for probably two or three years now. Now the chamber strings definitely have more legato options. And what I like is, you can see here, I've got all one, two, three, four, five, all six legatos plugged into my template. But what I love is they're not different types of legatos. They're legato for different types of performances. And that's how I really think. Having a consordino legato is just amazing. And I really think that Spitfire's Flotando is better than anybody else's I've heard, hands down. And a Sopant legato? Are you kidding me? Just really, really versatile. Lots of great articulations to choose from. And I think, yeah, it's just two contact instances, so... Whoops, there's the second one. Looks like... Yeah, I, I think I remember pulling this in. I had 30, 33 or 34 chosen that I wanted to do, and I just didn't want to have to do a third instance of contact times five or six for all of these over here, so I parsed it down to 32 patches for each one of these. And again, this is going to be identical to violin one. Viola's probably identical as well. Maybe a little less, if I remember correctly. Yep. So see where I've got these blank ones? That is where there are violin patches that are not represented in the viola. Because if I started filling things in and then if, if, if I didn't leave that space there, I'd get really confused in my template. A lot of what I, a lot of times what I like to do is make all my violin tracks and then just duplicate them. And I'll copy it down at the bottom and I rename them violin too because I like everything to be in order with the same MIDI channel. And this way I've got blank MIDI channels that don't necessarily show up in the template, but I, I know that they're not being used for a reason. And if I'm trying to find whatever patch that is on the violins and it was not recorded on violas, I can see there's a blank MIDI channel there and I know that it doesn't exist as opposed to assuming, which is probably a safe assumption, that I somehow messed up and it's not where it's supposed to be. <laughs> a lot of it just comes down to um, beating myself at my own game and outsmarting myself a little bit. Because when you're in the heat of battle, you're not going to remember how all this stuff was done, which patches were covered in the violas versus which patches were covered in the violins. Did the contrabass have that extra? Well, I... I guess you could just assume if it's not there, it's not included, but too many times I've accidentally moved something. And this way I know for sure. And Cine Sample Violins, all split out. And when you see JGM in the patch name, all it really means is I've tweaked the patch somehow to what I like. And it could be a mixed thing, it could be um, you know breaking out multis so that I've got them on individual channels instead of all split on one. I know there's not a lot to see here, but you get the general idea. Now, what's this? Ah, trills. So these are probably all trills. I renamed this one, and then I got real lazy, and I didn't rename those. What a surprise. And ensemble stuff. Novo, I also love. Everyone knows how much I love Heaviosity. And some really great stuff. I mean, honestly, I use their sound design side of this library more than I use the strings, but the strings sound really, really nice. I love the shorts. They've got a lot of bite to them. High and low Novo. And then now we're back to Aaron, my friend Aaron's stuff. Um, soaring strings and trailer strings. No, adventure strings. That's right. So soaring strings, for those of you that don't know, is just this absolutely wonderful legato, lots of vibrato, basically made to punch through the mix. And talk about layering, I will layer these on almost everything, especially the violins. <clears throat> but if I'm doing an especially expressive sort of thing, I'll layer it within all five sections. And adventure strings has a lot of nice bite and attack and then trailer strings. Well, here, I'll, I'll do this, just so that you can 
It's all the articulations. It's everything that Aaron included and recorded. And they're all split out. So you see, like this actually has violas and cellos down here, long and short, because there's not as many patches. And it's all about quality, not quantity, with Aaron's stuff. And trailer strings, just another really great library. The best thing about doing all this is being able to write a phrase inside of Cubase and then just move the MIDI data up and down and see kind of what sounds good and what combinations sound good. And a lot of times it will be what I'm expecting, but sometimes something will pop out or sound extra realistic to my ears that I really wasn't expecting. And that's why I love having everything all in one big template and the ability to listen to it essentially at the same time. One of the things that I don't have that I just haven't gotten around to getting yet is the orchestral tools strings. And uh, they sent me Inspire. I did a little review for them and they sent me Inspire and it just made me, it inspired me, but don't to want to buy the strings even more because they really, really do sound nice. It's kind of like Orchestral Tools version of Albion. And then we've got Arc 3, all of their strings, all their articulations. Actually, I believe there's some stuff in here that I haven't even added yet, and I'm going to have to go back. The quintet from Arc is especially nice. Got to go back and add some, uh, some time patches. They had uh, repetitions, like recorded repetitions. And then certainly, last but not least, here we are at synths. Now I've got a bit of a hybrid kind of idea when I'm working on synths. And obviously a lot of it depends on the project and the sound I'm going for. These synths are like my bread and butter synths. And if I have, for example, eight instances of D.Va, it's because in the past I only had four and then I needed five or six or seven for a particular project and I added them in Cubase locally on my main machine. It's just not as efficient. You know, these, these slaves are kind of sitting, twiddling their thumbs a little bit because they're so powerful. So having them process the synths, uh, I think, is even smarter than having them deal with RAM and orchestra sample libraries. So the interesting split between slaves and a main computer, it's like the slaves, I wanted to have lots of RAM so I could really beef up the streaming. The main computer, I wanted to have lots of processing power because it's basically in charge of doing all the plugins and the VST effects and things and kind of making all the audio work. And they work together sort of as a yin and a yang. Now I'm probably am going to have a separate episode that talks about you know, my go-to synths or synths I really love and specific patches and things like that. This is just going to be a quick overview of what's in the template. So, yes, eight instances of D.Va because I ended up needing more. Oh my gosh. There's a reason Yuhi is up here at the top of the list. They're probably my favorite soft synth developers, hands down. I, I really love Arturia as well. Arturia's more classic old school vintage I mean, I know that this is classic old school vintage, but it's like a hybrid mishmash of it. So I love Zebra. I love Zebra HC. I love Hive. I love Repro 1 and 5, which I need to put in here. It's come out since I've done this. And a real nice tip for anyone who's going to roll their eyes and get tired of hearing me talk about this, but if it comes to any of synthesizers, I pretty much exclusively use sounds from the unfinished. And uh, that's Matt Boulder. Um, he's in the UK. In my opinion, one of the best synth preset sound design guys around. And I hire him whenever I have a new project. Uh, he works on stuff. Uh, what did he do? He did... Um, well, I've got them all grouped in here together. Well, here, this was our beta, which <laughs> he has the best names that I was working on Far Cry Primal. And that's basically the, the first round of sounds that he did for me for Far Cry Primal. And then he released it as a commercial pack and called it... Now I can't remember, but I seem to recall it having Graves, Grav. 
it starts with the GRA. That's that's all I remember. But his stuff, um, it's all normally released in individual sections like this. And if I have new ones, which these are the newest ones I've gotten from him, I'll have them here. But for the most part, I dump everything into one folder so that I can just see what all the arpeggios are. Or I can go over and see what all the bass lines are. And, I mean, as you can see, there's like thousands of patches. It's basically like getting a new synth every time he comes out with new sound packs. And I know he's done stuff for Diva and Zebra and um, Omnisphere and uh, tons of other stuff. It's the unfinished is his moniker and you can Google it and you will be as happy as I am. And I've never had like 30 bucks, you know, be better spent. Serum, I mean, what's there to say? It's amazing. And for trailer stuff, or if I need some aggressive cutting sort of synths, I mean, it's it's stands up right next to Massive as far as I'm concerned. Um, Synthmaster, another, oh man, I really love this synth. It's got so much possibility, and it's actually really straightforward to program. Um, it reminds me um, a lot of Omnisphere as far as synths go, um, without all the sound design and audio capability, except it's a little easier to approach. Sometimes I can get lost in Omnisphere. Love this. Uh, Sarah Schachner turned me on to this when we were talking about synths, and it's basically a modeled vacuum tube synthesizer. Really fat, great presets. And the best part about it, it has two parts that can run. So you could literally put two separate patches in here, or a lot of times a patch on this side will have two parts running that are made to go with each other, so you get some of that nice buildup and kind of tube distortion going on. I can't help it. I just am such a sucker for Roland. I really love this synth. Again, so straightforward and easy to program, and it really does sound incredible. I've got a JX8P. Can you see it? The second keyboard, the one right below the Prophet 12, love that keyboard. It's from 1985, I believe, and it sounds amazing. And this is a really nice VST version of basically the 106, the Juno 106. Another very dancey, and it's, a, it's a, a rompler, meaning you can't go in and tweak as much as you would want. It's playing back pre-recorded sounds, but man, some of those sounds are really, really nice. I wish I could make the interface big. It kind of it kind of looks small when you go from this, which you can resize, and you go to this, and you're ending up leaning in and trying to see things, but it does have some really great sounds. I think the last time I used that was on Evolve, just some big, fat sort of synthy sounds. And now we're in the NI camp. I mean, I, just, I, ha I have to have these things in here. I need to be able to pull them up and go to them. Um, Absinthe and Massive, two more huge unfinished playgrounds that you can go explore. Of course, Omnisphere. And I just do two instances and I use their output. You know, within the multi, I'll use these outputs. They're routed straight out of VE Pro and come back into Cubase as separate stereo outputs. A trillion, same thing. I mean, what are you going to say? I don't use RX a lot, but when I need it, man, is it ever cool. And then we're down to my contact. Oh, hey, look. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> yeah, what did I say about heaviosity? So I've got two instances of contact right now. I, I did eight to start out with, and I think it might have been a little bit overkill because I never went past maybe here, uh, the eighth channel of the second one. Um, it's just really nice to have... If, for example, I want to do something like Masse, however you pronounce that, or maybe some of the Albion, um, what do they call them? Like the Brunel Loops or the Steam Band, and any of that more sound design-y stuff, it's nice to have these instances here. And also I'll come down here and sometimes use some of the synth stuff and this is all like drums and things, but um, una corda, wow, that's really nice. So it's just a matter of having the option. My preference is to run stuff on the slaves and have them generate sound and then 
do all the processing on the main computer. That seems to be the best way to split things up and kind of divide the processing power evenly. So strings and synths. I believe that's it for this one. And you know what that means. Wait, I forgot to mention Patreon. I know VE Pro isn't the most logical thing to kind of share and open, but I was thinking if, if you've got any of the libraries that I have, when you open up the session, it'll open everything and auto configure. The only downside is if you don't have any of the libraries that I have, you're gonna get prompted for dialog boxes in contact or you're gonna get prompted, I think, via VE Pro if there's a synthesizer missing. So use at your own discretion, but for what it's worth, I'm gonna put all of them up on Patreon and the link will be down in the comments. You can grab them and mess around with them if you want to. And if you have any routing questions or anything like that, feel free to ask. Now, you know what that means. Cue the turkey. <laughs>